Okay, Act 5, Scene 1 of The Tempest. I'd like to focus on the characterization of Prospero in these 32 lines or so, the first 32 lines of Act 5, Scene 1. We see a very different Prospero than we did when we first met him in Act 1, Scene 2. We see a Prospero who is no longer full of rage and anger and trying to control himself in terms of his, his anger against his brother. We saw that, for example, in uh, Act 1, Scene 2, with his use of aposiopesis. Aposiopesis, self, self-interrupting, uh, like on page 13. When he is speaking to Miranda, and every time he introduces the subject of his uncle, thy uncle called Antonio, line 66, and line 77, thy false uncle, he then interrupts himself with... I pray thee mark me, and dost thou attend me? He interrupts his himself. And at first it just seems, you know, he wants to make sure his daughter is listening. Okay, there's, there's probably more to it than that. Through these self-interruptions, he calms, he keeps himself calm, he keeps himself focused. He probably, he, he is so full of rage with his, with the false uncle, with his brother Antonio. And if you remember, at the beginning of this play, with the, with the Tempest, that has been that has been that he's called up he could have decimated all his enemies this is a man who from the very beginning though his plot and his plan is to forgive and yet he has to fight with himself and his own impulses to not do so and so in act 1 scene 2 we see a man who is very much trying to control the urges to take revenge on his on his brother, and this could be then therefore a very, very different play, not a romance. It would become a tragedy if he fell uh, victim to his his anger, his, his passionate anger. But in Act 5, Scene 1, we don't see that same passionate anger. We see a man who speaks very calmly, a man who has full awareness of what he's doing. We see a man who starts Act 5, Scene 1, with again the many references to time. Now does my project gather to a head, my charms crack not, my spirits obey. So the use of repetition here, the anaphora, but also isocolon, this idea that the the sentences are balanced, the grammar in them. Now does my project gather to a head, my charms crack not, my spirits obey. It's rhythmically very balanced and orderly, which is reflecting where this play is heading, and by forgiving where yes where the where this play will go where this will not become a tragedy if you remember this is a man who this is a magician who has been fully aware of the time fully aware of fully in control of a situation and yet it is also a man who is battling with this mag- magician man dichotomy within himself he will in a few pages have the have the men under his control well he's, he has them under his control but he will have them under a spell and he will be able to boil their brains he will be able to harm them he he mentions here a project and his project is an an alchemist an an alchemist's project he first he uses imagery of, of alchemy gathering to a head and his charms are not cracking you know would not crack and not fail and he is performing experiments in human nature versus metallurgy, really. So it's it's alchemy, but psychological alchemy, if you will. He is fully in charge, though. This is a man who has not yet given up his powers. He has not given up his magic. He is he's still the magician. And he's still, though, um, he's starting to have an understanding of, of and, and his eyes are going to be opened, especially on this, just in a few lines, his eyes will be opened to what it means to be human and to what he will need to to do and to be in order to fully regain his dukedom and to prosper as Prospero will. He will have to learn to forgive. He will learn to be tender and he will learn that from Ariel in just a moment. We see though the hints of that, of, of time working upon him like it works on all men in the opening few lines of this, of, of page 125, opening lines of Act 5, Scene 1, he mentions, he, per, he personifies time, something that we, he seems to have control o- over as a magician when he repeats now and now throughout the play. But he personifies time here, and 
he mentions through this lovely image of imagery as an old man but going upright with his carriage. He is um, he, he's moving. The notes on the on the side say, "Time moves easily, free of burdens." Yes, I also see that though as the idea of time being personified. That same sort of personification of time you see sometimes at the New Year. You have old man. You have time represented as an old man, and we have that indication here of of of, of that's that's what awaits Prospero. Okay, and yet there's a dignity, there's a there's a strength still to him. We will start to see that strength fade, and by the end of the play, he will be mentioning what you know. He'll be saying something like, "What strength's my own?" So he will not have. Uh, he, he will acknowledge with humility his human status and non-magic status, but for the moment, he is still the magician, and yet it's being foreshadowed, it's being hinted at, um, and the dignity with which he will lay all that down for the sake of his daughter and his own prospering. Again, the questioning of time. We see a man who's in control, still is in control, will always be in control, will choose forgiveness, will choose uh, over, will cho choose reason over passion and anger. So Ariel notes and helps um, characterize Prospero and this man who is, has his lord, he says, and someone who has been in control and mentions on the sixth hour the work will cease and and he says, I did say so and it will and it will happen. Okay, uh, again we have that closeness between these two always, the possessive my spirit and and, uh, and and the gentleness with which he usually speaks with Ariel and we then get to see a little bit more about um, the situation that the the antagonists are in. That they have been put in a lime grove, which weather fends your cell. There's an there's an imagery here of them being under under protection. Yes, confined. Yes, being held by Prospero, but protected. We are reminded of the illusion at the beginning of the play that hinted at where this play was was moving towards this non-tragic ending, in that um, when Prospero keeps asking, are the men okay? Have they been harmed? Ariel, on the top of 23, makes an allusion to the Bible, and he says, not a hair perished. This is alluding to the idea that God loves us so much that not even a hair, he, he won't even let even a hair on our heads um, uh, be hurt. And so, of course, in the beginning, we weren't completely sure and even up to this point we're not sure what he will do to his to the to, to Antonio to Antonio and Sebastian and even Alonso but um we are fairly sure that he is capable of of this um forgiveness it won't be a total surprise yeah he has been very careful he has tried to protect them as we see again on page 125 the beginning of act 5 scene 1 line 11 or so and the line grove which weather fends your cell they are the men are very distracted, and we see the the effects of the quote sea change that the magician Prospero has acted has has enacted upon them. From the very beginning of the play, we see the the this use of water imagery, the 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 capability of water to wash clean all faults, all moral muddiness, all it, 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 this, this imagery has been used throughout the entire play, um, and of course. We, we see that Gonzalo has been crying. His tears are running down his beard like a lovely simile here, winter's drops from the eaves of reeds, very natural imagery, a uh, natural um, weeping for uh, uh, full of sorrow and dismay for the situation these men are in, uh, probably also because Gonzalo sees the, the evil that these men have um, committed. He, he was fully aware of the, the evil that they committed upon Prospero and his daughter by setting them adrift in the boat. And, and of course, all of this water imagery sets the stage for Prospero's own transformation. He also will be undergoing a sea change. When Ariel mentions the men, he says, your charm so strongly works them that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. So we're looking at the future tense here and the compassionate nature with which Ariel, a non-human, regards these men who have, who have done wrong. And yet he believes that the magic that's working on them is working so well that if Prospero to see them, he too would forgive them. He he too would become compassionate. 
Prospero, again using the very personal thou pronoun, asks, Dost thou think so, spirit? Mine would, sir, were I human. So we have this lovely sharing of the lines. The fact that this Ariel, this creature who's been in his servitude, is of a position to be able to teach Prospero something. Remember, he was the one character who, well, Caliban as well, with his curses, but Ariel is able to actually stand up to Prospero. He questions and says, well, you said you'd free me, and why aren't you freeing me? He's he's not um, completely uh, a servile character. We see a, a compassionate relationship. We see a, um, a friendly relationship between the two, where they, where it's, and Shakespeare does this so that Prospero can actually learn from Ariel. And mine shall. It's definitive with the word shall there. In the future, it will happen. The irony of a non-human creature teaching Prospero how to be human is helping us move from the world of illusion and magic to a, a well-grounded Prospero, someone who will be um, grasping what it means to be human, what he has to do in order to allow his daughter to return to quote-unquote civilization and prosper. He, though, at this point, he's starting his, his eyes are starting to be opened to the idea that he is he mentions that he's also one of their kind and he questions how it is that Ariel of who is but heir can have such feelings and he mentions also this idea of passion he says that relish all as sharply passion as they so he is full of passion as they are and yet he is going to choose just as he we've seen with all this imagery of time and the plot and the plan he has chosen reason he is going to choose to forgive. And it happens rather quickly, though, on the top of 127, so lines 25. Um, I'm struck to the quick, all right, with his, their high wrongs. He's so struck by how awful they've been to him. Yet, with my nobler reason, against, against my fury, you know, the, the, the juxtaposition of reason and fury, he takes part, he's going to choose this. And the verbs are very strong, very simple. Do I take part? The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. It happens rather quickly. It's almost like the beginning of a play with his having to interrupt himself, having to maintain control, going to do it. He's, he's going to choose. He's going to choose the rarer action, which is virtue, than take revenge. This play will not become a tragedy. Uh, all he wants is that these men are penitent, so, not a frown further, he says, go release them, Ariel, my charms I'll break, their senses I'll restore, and they shall be themselves. So this lovely fluid sounds, plus the use of the future tense here, highlight highlight what's in store. In just a few moments he will vow, and he will be fighting with himself in this next monologue to give up the powers he's had, and turn this play from a potential tragedy to a play of forgiveness, a romance, and he will forgive his brother, who has tr who has tried to commit fratricide. But he will reject magic and the hubris with which he had, as in his ability to raise the dead, we'll see in a moment. He will turn away from all of that and embrace a true magic, true magic of forgiveness and love. So to conclude this opening of Act 5, Scene 1, we see a very different Prospero than we saw in the beginning. We saw the, the seeds, the potential for this character. We saw in his desire to keep everyone safe. We saw that this play would not turn tragic, but there was always that potential. Now, if you remember, again, this is an experiment that he is putting the other men through, but in fact, it's in general a tempest for them all. It's if you remember, a tempest is a term for sifting out impurities from a mixture in alchemy. And Prospero himself will be undergoing a sea change, will have his own impurities sifted out from himself. He will be rejecting the magician and embracing the man. And with that will come the balance and restoration of order. So this tempest, this watery imagery, which serves for its baptismal imagery in, in terms of cleansing everyone and and having them undergo a sea change, Prospero himself will be undergoing that sea change. And Shakespeare uses that water imagery throughout to make it very clear how important 
the balance, this natural balance is between these elements of fire and water, which was highlighted in the, the scene prior with the mask, the male fiery images and then the, the female watery cool images balancing each other out, that indeed will be the way that Prosper, Prospero can prosper, restoring his proper dukedom, restoring his daughter to the position she, even higher position than she was meant to have, and bringing everything back to healing and restoration and order. Okay, we're on 127. I, I'll walk you through it, all right? I, I have a feeling it'll be just less chaotic. In class, of course, I'd be asking your opinions, but if you have questions, just jump in, okay? Um, if you were given these lines as part of an oral, right, it is coming right after the, the 33 lines or so that I mentioned in the beginning, where we see very clearly that he's resolved to forgive his brother in saying the rare action is in virtue than in vengeance. And then what's interesting is um, as he's waiting for Ariel to fetch the, the, the men and bring them to him, he addresses in a very formal tone with the plural pronoun ye, elves of bri brooks and standing lakes and groves. He uses an honorific, a really formal address. And he, with that, and probably with the fact that the audience would have understood that he's taking language directly from Ovid's Metamorphosis, classical text of, of Shakespeare's time, you know, of, and, and, and our time. But he, he's, he's drawing from that imagery, if not actual lines. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. But um, calling on the elves, the brooks, the standing lakes, obviously it's full of magical imagery. So if you were to get this passage, you need to mention that, okay? And the fact that he's addressing this crowd of spirits and magical creatures around him, he um, is adding, obviously, to the atmosphere that's already been set up from the very beginning of the play. And we're going to look a little bit more about that. But he is going to be giving up this illusory, magical world. But before he does so, he needs to show, well, Shakespeare needs to show us how hard it is for him. And he's going to be doing this by, by spending, you know, having quite a lot of nostalgia for the past and for the magic. And it starts out rather soft. Um, the sands, printless foot, there's lots of, you know, chase, the ebbing Neptune, the sounds are soft, the ends and, and the S's and things. But then he, um, when he refers to his pup, uh, demi-puppets, or the tiny spirits, they don't seem particularly harmful. When, If you look over on the left, it says uh, half-sized puppets. They're not particularly threatening. There's nothing scary about them. And even there's the allusions to those, um, I think we might call them crop circles. I'm not, I'm not too sure, actually. Or the fairy rings. The strange sort of markings that happen in a garden sometimes that are caused by... Um, some kind of fungi, some kind of, uh, you know, fungus in the garden, we now know, you know, scientifically makes these sort of strange patterns in the, gra in the grass. But um, back in Shakespeare's day, uh, probably for a couple hundred years after, uh, um, people believed that fairies were making those um, marks. And so we see that with the green, on line 37, the green sour ringlets make whereof the ewe not bites, okay, so the, the, the sheep doesn't eat that grass, and the mentioning of moonshine, and all these allusions and references and imagery of magic, okay, um, are adding to his sense of nostalgia and to the very magical atmosphere that Shakespeare created throughout, okay? And he does allude to Neptune in line in the third line to remind us of the, the power that the, the, uh, the retreating tide has, and, the, and again, so that this this water imagery will come in and come in again and come in kind of repeatedly, repeatedly through this passage, this monologue that he speaks. Um, and, and I'll hopefully comment on that. Just remind me if I don't, but we'll come back to it. It's it's almost you know like a wave kind of motion throughout. It comes it, it comes through. It comes the imagery comes throughout the passage. Again, if there's a question, I have it set so I can see the the messages coming in. So uh, just let me know. Just look at the soft sounds on 39 is to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew. Okay, don't read too much into those mushrooms. But yeah, there's something kind of magical about them. All right. Um, and he refers to the spirits as weak masters, demi puppets. 
I think this is important because, yes, not only is he reminiscing about the past here, I, I just in, in, in the context of the play, this is the moment where he's giving up the, his, his magic. It's the moment where he is going to be fully accepting his human role, uh, you know, giving up the god, giving up the magic, giving all of that up, right? And this is going to be a difficult thing for him. He's had an incredible amount of power, which we're about to see. But I think it's important that um, Shakespeare, not necessarily Prospero here, but Shakespeare is making it clear that his power is nothing in relation to what the discovery that Prospero will make at the end and his call to prayer at the end and his call to understanding that he is, uh, even in his power, a minor figure in context of, of, of God, really. Uh, he can't refer to God on the stage here in, in in Shakespeare's time. He couldn't refer to God. So he will refer to Neptune. He will refer to other gods and things. But interestingly enough, he makes them demi-puppets, the spirits, and weak masters. Nothing in comparison to the the power that he has had. I might be getting off the point, but I'll, I'll see if I can hopefully make this a little bit clearer. Okay, so he has this nostalgia for the past, a really an, an, an internal struggle for giving it up. Because we see then, he, he in the middle of his monologue, he says, Weak masters, though ye be, I have bedimmed. So he then shifts it to his power. I have, very clearly, bedimmed the noontide sun. All right, so in this period of time, in Shakespeare's age, there was a real belief in magic and a real belief in witches and the power of those witches. To, if you remember from your study of Macbeth, to be able to to, to do unnatural things like um, blocking out the sun, and he, um, just like the character of Sycorax, they would have believed that these two magicians would have had the power to affect the orbs, you know, the the, the moon, the sun, Venus, whatever. Okay, which of course we know is ridiculous, but uh, he saying here very clearly, I have bedimmed the noon time tide sun. He has, in the past, he's done it. Called forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azure vault set roaring war. He has been all-powerful. He started the tempest at the beginning of the play. Between the green sea and the, and the blue, the azure vault of the, of the heavens, he has set very strong verbs, I have bedimmed, he has called forth, he has set roaring war, he is capable of great destruction, mutiny, and, and, and very violent imagery here, no order. He has, he has, he has um, his power that he used to have, uh, and indeed still has at this moment of the play, is all-powerful. To highlight that, a syndeton is the idea that you put, um, for example, he says, I have bedimmed the noontime sun, comma, called forth. He doesn't use a conjunction there, right? And this seems like a really small detail. But when you, um, you slow things down by putting in um, and, 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 yeah, you can, it, it sort of keeps order. Um, he uses the same grammatical format that on page 141, if you, if you skip to 141, keep your hand on 127. 141, he refers in the same way to Sycorax. So, a syndeton on page 141, if you look at the bottom of the page, just to find a parallel, because you, you want enough to say, right, in your oral. And if, remember, you can make quick little jumps to other parts of the story, and you also need to make sure you understand the relevance of this particular passage and to the whole context of the story, of the play. So, at the bottom of 141, what's interesting about the way he speaks with this a syndeton is, he says, Mark but the badges of these men, my lords then say if they be true. This misshapen knave, and here's where it comes, his mother was a witch, that's Sycorax, and one so strong that could control the moon, comma, make flows and ebbs and deal in her command without her power. It's a very small point here, but between control the moon, make flows and ebbs, there's no connective word. There's no, there's no and. There's something that adds the sort of continuation of his power it's not, I've done this and this and this. It's just a, a real flow of his power. A real, It makes it stronger. Okay, I but dimmed the noontime sun, called forth the mutinous winds. Okay, so it, it just sort of adds to the sound of the power. And an actor would know when you're reading that 
how um, much more powerful it is instead of just having and, 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 okay? There are ands in there, but it's that particular, the noontime sun, and then the other one with the moon, okay? There's a parallel between those two lines. It's really highlighting the fact that these two magicians have mastered the the, um, the spheres, the, the planets, the moon and the sun. Carrying on, uh, he has had great power. Now look at the sounds, the, the rest of it. To the dread rattling thunder I have given fire. It becomes very elemental here, very powerful with the imagery of fire and thunder. And then ripping apart like a lightning bolt could. Uh, he can't mention God, but Jove's stout oak, the strongest, most you know, princely tree, if you will, there is, okay? Um, we had that imagery of the oak earlier with a princely tree on page 13. Small detail. You don't need to make a, a link to it there. But uh, to refer to, at the bottom of 13, he refers to the princely trunk his, uh, of himself, Prospero does. We're reminded of the very noble uh, idea of, a tr of an oak, the strength of an oak. And Prospero has managed to split an oak tree with his own, with Jove's own bolt, with um, with the god's own lightning bolt. Okay, so alluding to to uh, putting him, placing himself up with these gods, Neptune, Jove, placing himself at the same level as these gods, which we all know to be hubris. Uh, we all know in Greek literature, classical mythology, that when you are guilty of hubris, you fall. Humans are not to be at the level of the gods. They are punished when they are. If you look up your stories of Bellerophon, if you look at the story of Icarus, you're meant to have a more moderate path in life, not aspire to be a god. And it's interesting that Shakespeare puts in two allusions to the gods here, plus has the imagery that's so very strong. The strong based, um, with his own bolt, the strong based promontory have I made. And I, I think it's interesting that he doesn't say I, he says in the beginning, I have bedimmed. And then the word order is shifted. I, have I given fire. The rhythm shifts on lines 45, 46, 47 with the inverted word order. There's something uh, stronger in a way about the fact that he's shifting and the repetition of have I given fire, have I made shake. There's something, there's sort of a power there in his, his, his rearranging the sort of normal grammatical order. The inverted word order and the shift in rhythm reflects a world that would be should Prospero maintain his destructive powers, the potential tragedy that this play could be. And the rhythm reflects that disorder. And have I made shake? All in the past tense again. So the past tense, this is all over. He's about to give it up. And by the spurs, plucked up and pine cedar. All the P sounds and D sounds are very strong um, and active. And the imagery of graves at my command have waked their sleepers. This man has raised the dead, hoped and let them forth by so my, by my so potent art. Possessive, his art, he has woken men from their sleep, from graves, from waken the sleepers. Should remind us of the imagery that is used throughout the play with sleeping and dead, and we'll, we'll look at that again um, in a page or two. And this whole idea of, of, of sleep and, 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 and all that imagery. But it's really important here that it's showing his complete power that he's had. We, we do not see him ra raising the dead. Um, you know, you kind of wonder who he's raised to the dead on, on this island. It doesn't matter, really. It's a play. But um, it is it is probably the pinnacle of one's power, this necromancy, this dark magic to be able to raise the dead. And then all of a sudden, in this long passage, he cuts what he's saying on line 50 with a conjunction, but this rough magic, I hear of Jor. It's extremely short, extremely quick. And... Um, it's interesting that he he shifts this all this power he's had the softness of it the magic of it the you know the demi puppets the weak masters of the little the little sprites and things and then all of a sudden contrasting that with the power he's had and he gives it all up. It's almost parallel to how he has to interrupt himself in the beginning scene with Miranda when he is so angry with his brother that he has to con try to contain that anger by interrupting himself. I would, there's something similar here in the shortness of his statement that he has to um, has to do it quickly. I give it up. And when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it, certain fathoms in the earth, 
and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. The lines after this very short declaration of I'll give up my magic, he is commenting on the power of music, right? And the and how music throughout this play has signified power, magical power. He is going to be when he says when I have required some heavenly music, because he does, he knows a specific time still when he will need this music. He still is aware of his plot and his plan. But there's a recognition here with the with him saying, when I have required, he's going to need. We see a man who needs that power, the music of the, the magic in order to to have had all, you know, to have done all these things he's done, obviously. This power comes from somewhere, this, ma this magic comes from somewhere that he's been able to tap into because of his long study with his books and things. He obviously then needs the staff with the, with the swords. We've seen him, we've seen him use the staff and, and the power that it holds, but he's going to bury it, okay? The verb is significant here. It's a verb of, of death. He's going to put it fathoms in the earth. Fathom, remember too, fathoms is only really used for water, when you measure the ocean. So it's interesting here that he's got this comparison of the staff he's going to bury in the earth and then completely disconnected from from that, far, far from it, deeper than ever did plummet sound, so measuring the depth of the water, how many fathoms deep the water is, he'll drown his book. So there, he's going to be separating those two completely. It sounds very final, it's very elemental, very, very clear. The imagery is very sure that he will be killing burying and drowning his magic. If you turn the page to 129, I asked you to look at this, so hopefully you've broken it down. You have uh, the scene, this, the rest of the scene then, some solemn music starting. We're reminded what, if, what he's just said about the power of um, music, uh, really symbolizing magic here. And Prospero then traces out a circle on the stage, keeping in mind in this period of history, people really did believe in devilish magic. Um, they, when S Sebastian hears that he understands the plot, he will say the devil speaks in him. They did believe in possession. They did believe demonic possession. And this would have been a fantastically dramatic scene. You know, this idea that he's actually showing us a magical, a magical spell on the stage. And all the men, um, you just want, you want to read through the stage directions there. You've got, um, Ariel, you, you've got them attended, you know, the, the different men, but then he puts them all in the circle and they stand there charmed. A solemn air, says Prospero, and he mentions this idea of the, the, the music is fitting what's happening here, okay? It's a solemn harmonious, he says, believe to cure madness. So what he's trying to do now with his, the end of his sort of uh, experiments in alchemy, I sent a, a yesterday a picture of an alembic he's basically boiling their boiling their brains in their skulls in order to purify uh, and regenerate them yeah strange medical sort of theory here but he is um, going to cure thy brains he's trying to cure their cure their maladies okay and it's a reference to his use of this alchem you know this kind of language of alchemy uh, imagery of alchemy and he says, he's going to cure their brains, now now useless, boiled within thy skull. There stand, for you are still spell stopped. You'll see then that he first addresses uh, Gonzalo, okay? And the sounds are very soft, dissolves apace, morning steals, darkness. Um, you know, there's there's no, he has no anger uh, at Gonzalo. And a, he understands the, he says, fall fellow drops, weep friendly or sympathetic tears. He has... You know, he has witnessed Gonzalo um, uh, in, in sorrow over the situation of these men and of, of, of uh, Prospero's case. He, um, he has nothing against good or holy Gonzalo. If you were given this passage, you need to make sure, obviously, to look at the... Um... Yes, we're on page 129. Okay, so if you were given this passage, and again, you know, the likelihoods of getting... If you Your maths are much better than mine, everyone, so your statistics of getting what page, you know... There are so many good passages in this play. You know, you want to make sure you've looked at the the really, you know, the ones really full of good Im imagery and things, but they could give you anything. So the trick is to always be looking for what Shakespeare does constantly and throughout, all right? So to look at his style. He makes it very clear through the adjectives. If you have nothing else to say, mention Holy Gonzalo. If you have nothing else to say, remember 
you getting to um, to character. There's nothing wrong with the characterization of Gonzalo here. Good Gonzalo, true preserver, loyal. All right. And Prospero then announces on line seventy, "I will pay thy graces, home both in word, in and in um, and deed." He he owes him. He has um, he has been nothing but good to Prospero and to his daughter in helping them. The the imagery here. He is speaking to Gonzalo, but then he speaks of the charm is starting to dissolve. Okay, as the and he uses a, a lovely simile here on line sixty five. The charm dissolves apace as the morning steals upon the night, melting the darkness. Now, this imagery of the spell they're under dissolving is really important, okay? In terms of, I can give you lots of examples of it, and they'll come up even more as we carry on with Act 5, but the, the spell has to end. If you remember, I took you through the last, the epilogue, the actual, the last epilogue that uh, Prospero speaks at the end of the play. It has to end. The illusion has to end. If you look back on on page 115, so keep your thumb on 129 and then look back on 115. It's confusing in life to sometimes make out the difference between illusion and reality. Just like when the clowns find the clothing and Caliban gets frustrated that they are fascinated by the apparel, the clothing, and losing track of the plot to get rid of Prospero, they... Um, it, Shakespeare uses that imagery throughout to remind us of how difficult it is to stay stay grounded in reality. And so 115, Prospero mentions it in his sort of mini epilogue, if you will, the epilogue of the, of the mask, stating on line 154, Yea, all which it inherit, the great globe itself, right, the earth, but also a theatrical allusion to the, the theater space, shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Our entire existence is 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 surrounded by um, this imagery of sleep and dream he's using here. It is um, it is difficult sometimes to distinguish between illusion and reality. I'll I'll keep it simple, right there for now. Okay because it does come up again and again, and if it hasn't been made clear by the end, someone will let me know, I'm sure, okay? So that's just one instance of the idea that illusions need to fade, or the importance of Prospero and everyone having their eyes opened to to reality, and the, the reality in this case is they have to move off this island, they have to get back to to life. This imagery of the, the spell is ending. So literally on the stage, the spell that he has these men under is starting to wane. It's starting, they're starting to wake up, okay, uh, to, to, take, to, 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 face, to have a clearer reason. It, it all matches everything he's done, you know, from this, this anger he had to the reason he has to his change, his, his eyes opening to what he needs to do and to how he needs to prosper in his life. All of it is, 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 is tied together. And so now, uh, he moves on then, most cruelly did thou, Alonso, use me. So he's addressing Alonso then on 72. Uh, use me and my daughter, all right? And thy brother, Sebastian, was a furtherer in the act. So if it wasn't clear why Sebastian was linked together as um, the three men of sin, well, it's being made clear here, okay? Uh, thou art pinched for it now. So what he's doing to them, he's actually, just like he does, he gives pinches to um, Caliban and, and, and tortures him with physical pinches, or maybe mental ones too, but physical pinches, we get the idea. Um, he's, he's, um, he's, he's torturing them, he's hurting them. Flesh and blood, you brother mine, that entertained ambition, expelled remorse. There's lots of eh sounds, and ah, there's kind of, um, I think an actor could have a really good time with those sounds, because there's, there's, a real, there's a real anger that he has towards his brother here, if you remember, but he has vowed to forgive him. And look again how quickly that's going to happen. Entertained ambition, expelled remorse in nature, who with Sebastian, whose inward pinches therefore are most strong. All right, so inward pinches, I guess, does he, can he read his mind? It's, it's not very clear, but he's definitely tormenting these men for sure. Would have killed your king. So he's, he's reminding us, the audience, he's reminding us that uh, Sebastian obviously had a plot against his own brother, Alonso. Uh, he would have killed uh, the king, Alonso. And then very quickly, after a semicolon, I do forgive thee, unnatural though thou art. So it seems sudden once again. 
Okay, it's almost like, oh, okay, I'm going to forgive you. Um, then there's a break here. Hopefully you found the same breaks I did. Okay, there's a, you know, this this uh, this idea of them being from maybe a solemn air to spell stopped, then focusing on Gonzalo, then focusing on Alonso, and then quickly shifting it to, you know, to his enemies, to Sebastian and Antonio, and then forgiving him, his brother. The last part of it, um, I think it's interesting. Again, I mentioned this idea of sea imagery coming throughout. And he says their understanding begins to swell. So the verb here is very much connected to sea imagery. And we're reminded of the fact that they're all going to undergo a sea change. And the approaching tide will shortly fill the reasonable shore. So three instances here of water imagery again. And this idea of where the men were before, you know, and the state, the psychological and moral state they're in, it's foul and muddy. And the sea is going to come in and wash it all clean. So we have, again, this baptismal imagery, okay? This idea of cleansing. Um, so Shakespeare is matching what Prospero has managed to do by forgiving his brother and the others. Uh, he is reinforcing it with uh, sea and baptismal and cleansing imagery. And it's a pretty universal idea. Not one of them that yet looks on me or would know me, Ariel. Fetch me a hat, rapier, and myself. So he realizes that he's all of a sudden just had a re realization that if the men were to wake and see him now, they won't recognize him. So he is, Shakespeare loves these clothing motifs, this idea of, you know, putting on. He's going to put on Milan. He's going to become, no, he's going to put on the robes of Milan and become the Duke once again, Okay. That has been foreshadowed, of course, with the use of a mask. I mentioned that. If you didn't get to see that link, it's important to understand the importance of the, the richness of that of that imagery. You know, he's it, we, we're preparing his Shakespeare's preparing his return to his rightful position, but he needs to look the part as well. Okay, we're reminded of the the foolishness in a way sometimes of appearances, but yet sometimes they are very important. Um, they can be deceptive, and in this case, they're going to help the men see clearly. All right. I will discase me and myself present as I was sometime, Milan, quickly spirit, and thou shalt ere long be free. Reminded of Ariel's freedom. We're on top of 131. Okay, we're on 131. So this is a pretty famous little song. Uh, it's a song of freedom. Notice Shakespeare's use of a trochaic tetrameter here. And then the very final lines are, are dactylic. They're very quick in order to give that otherworldly quality to the way Ariel sings. He uses similar meter in his other songs. Um, trochaic meter is the opposite of uh, iambic. All right, a, tro a trochi is an opposite of an iamb. So if an iamb is meant to be copying the most natural speech, then obviously trochaic would be very unnatural, very otherworldly. Hopefully you'll notice he sings with where, if you look at the, the line, the scansion, it's called, right? If you look at how many, how many, um, syllables there are, where the bee sucks there suck I, where the bee suck there suck I, it's seven, it's seven, 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 and then last, merrily, merrily shall I live now, that's ten, under the blossom, blossom that hangs on the bough, so um, you have a, a, a very different meter than anything we've seen so far, you could look back and compare it to the um, full Fathom Five song, it is, again, a song, and it's full of magic because of that. And it gives a kind of otherworldly characterization to our Ariel, once again, who um, is now singing. If you remember, we, we see this, we've seen this character. If you've got this passage, you want to make, make sure how it, it shows us a little bit more about his character. He has been so active, so obedient, so attentive to his master. And then now, all of a sudden, it's about himself. It's about himself and his being at one with nature, yeah, his oneness. He speaks of himself, I. We haven't seen that before, okay? In a cowslip's bell, I lie. And it's interesting that he's lying around, you know, it's it's been so active earlier. And now there I couch, he's lying on a, not a literal couch, but a couch, the verb. He's lying. He's not running around and doing the orders. And in, a, in and then in just about 10 lines, uh, 102, he'll say, I'll I drink the air before me and return air your pulse twice beat. He's very quick. He's a very quick physical creature. And yet in his little song, he is, he's lying back, he's kicking back and relaxing, okay? Under a, under a, under sort of spring 
flowers, cowslips bell I lie. And there I couch where when eagle when owls, sorry, do cry. On the bat's back I do fly after summer merrily. So a lovely enjambment there and a sense of sure activity again, but it's um it's much more languid. It's much more it's much more relaxed than we've seen Ariel before. And merrily, merrily shall I live now. It's very childlike, this rhythm, yeah? And the repetitions of merrily, merrily. It almost sounds like one of those um, songs children sing as they're turning around in a, in, a, in a circle, yeah? Merrily, merrily shall I live now under the blossom that hangs on the bough. So it's been uh, rhyming throughout, but that um, rhyming couplet certainly make is much clearer with a return to a sort of a, a beat of 10 here you know merrily merrily shall i live now under the blossom that hangs on the bough free yet he's connected with nature we see that motif of the natural the unnatural with what was unnatural on the part of prospero to be a magician and be at the level of a god and try to control nature the spheres for example dimming the noontide sun and a character like Ariel, who is going to go on to freedom and pure bliss, summer, you know, springtime imagery, all at one with nature, not working against it. Yeah, he's free and he's himself and it's all about himself, but he's connected um, with the spring and there's a real, there's a, there's a future tense here, positive future, present and future tense, much more positive than the negative um, than, than past tense can be, as we saw in the in the the juxtaposed in the scene prior, the solemn music prior um, to set the stage for the 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 boiling of the men's brains, and then the um, the, the 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 past tense with which Prospero speaks um, regarding um, his his past life and everything he's giving up. So Ariel speaks present and future tense. Always look at those things; they are important. Okay, so Prospero then calls him, as usual, his dainty Ariel, and I shall miss thee. Remember the pronouns, the closeness. But yet thou shalt have freedom. So his understanding that, you know, I'll miss you, but you'll have freedom. So there's a real love there, a real connection between these two. He can let him go. He can let his little spirit go. Just as he can let things go. And I think that's really important. There's a sense of now everyone going to be letting things go. or, um, or And by letting things go, finding things and that imagery will come up very soon all right so i mentioned ariel being very quick 102 uh he arrives prospero in his clothing and i think what's mostly important about this page is the very physical nature of it um obviously these, these men have been paraded around the island and looking at illusions and thinking themselves in a tempest and um not being clear as to, you know, basically they've had a, a real taste of the power of the island and its illusions. And again, this is a microcosm of life, you know, the power of illusions on us as well. Um, how we are all fooled by um, by appearances, so easily swayed by appearances, you know, it's it's ages old. And so these men have had, you know, their, their perceptions completely um, played with by Prospero. And so he recognizes on 109, he says, I embrace thy body. Okay, so he's going to actually go up and 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 and, and physically hug him. He says that, um, there's a, I've just lost the line, but he says, um, Alonso cannot believe it. He says, whether thou beest he or no, or some enchanted trifle to abuse me, as late as I have been, I not, I not know. Thy pulse beats as a flesh and blood. So very physical elements here. And I think that's introduced... If you were given this passage on 102, when Ariel says, I drink the air before me, ere your pulse twice beat, you can't get more human and physical than that, than the idea of a physical heartbeat. And it's a very, it's um, contrasting the, all the imagery we've seen, sorry, the imagery of illusion that we've seen versus now a very physical, um, in, to put it in my words, gr grounding the play now in, in um, reality, coming back to reality. He's, he's going to be giving up fully his magical powers. He's, he is now fully in a very physical, non-enchanted world, life from now on. 115, this must crave, and this is Alonso, and if this be at all a most strange story, thy dukedom I resign and do entreat thou pardon me my wrongs. So Prospero gets exactly what he wants from Alonso. He could see that he is has been changed, see changed, really. He has, he immediately asks for a pardon. 
Now, I think what's interesting here is view, um, keep in mind the chess imagery that's about to come up, you know, the imagery that he's about to show everyone on the island with Miranda and Ferdinand playing chess. If this were a chess game, uh, Prospero has just won. He has just captured the king. He's just captured Alonso. 133. First noble friend, let me embrace thine age. So this is Prospero to Gonzalo. Sorry, I should make the point first and then <laughs> support it. Okay, we're, we're further uh, characterization of Gonzalo here in his old age, his nobility and his wisdom and his honor. There was a moment where he was mocked for his perception and trying to be positive, landing on the island and his good nature. Um, and yet, m more importantly, Shakespeare has painted him as a wise figure, someone who sees clearly uh, who these men are and how they're punished for it. Uh, whether this be or be not, I'll swear not. You, you, uh, you do yet taste some subtleties of the isle that will not let you believe things certain. So once again, uh, Prospero is aware that these men are not able to really understand that they're not just seeing an illusion, that they really are seeing um, uh, Prospero in the flesh. And again, the embrace, so the physical um, hugging on the stage. But it's, what's, what's fun is that Prospero gets a little dig in to his, uh, his brother, Sebastian, by saying... But you, my brace of lords, were, were I so minded, I could, I here could pluck his highness's frown upon you and justify you traitors. He could denounce them to Alonso. He could say that they were traitors. He, he speaks this line to them. It's, I think, mostly meant to trigger the change in Sebastian's characterization. Remember, Sebastian had to be convinced by Antonio to kill his brother. This is not a, a natural thought that he had. This was, if you're looking back at Antonio's rhetoric, he is a very strong character, a very manipulative character, and able to convince Sebastian to try to kill Alonso, his brother. I think what's important here is the contrast between Sebastian and Alonso, uh, excuse me, Sebastian and Antonio on page 133. Antonio is silent. If you look down, he does not speak. He's going to be pardoned by his by his brother Prospero and then for pages he doesn't speak. It helps to characterize Sebastian who reacts and says the devil speaks in him meaning he thinks that Pros you know, Prospero knows something or has is being afflicted by um, by evil spirits and Prospero makes it very clear no he says for you most wicked sir whom to sir whom to call brother would it even infect my mouth I do forgive thy rankest fault and require thy dukedom of thee, which perforce I know thou must restore. He, he, he forgives them all, okay? Just to make it very clear that he's very quickly and assuredly forgiving them all, whether they've asked for forgiveness or not. And I think I made that point clear to you already, okay? The importance of you know, infant baptism, the promise of assured forgiveness in order to free Prospero, right? Again, most importantly, forgive in order to also free ourselves. Hence that imagery of of uh, Ariel being free is so important as well. Okay, all those parallels. Alonso mentions how much time has passed, three hours since, and he thinks of his son on line 139 through 37. Alonso and Prospero then speak of, if you look down the page, the fact that they both have lost a child. Uh, Prospero says that he's lost a child. He says, I have, lo have lost my daughter at the bottom of 133. Of course, he's being ambiguous. He speaks of being ambiguously of having lost uh, his daughter to Ferdinand. Okay, in this day and age, it would have been, yeah, anyway, just the imagery of giving his daughter. I mentioned that already in this time period. You would have given your daughter away. And I, I think what's interesting is that idea of loss, the idea of grief, and you should remember then the tears that have been shed throughout this play and the importance of Alonso needing to go through grief in order to have a sea change. He needed to feel and know that, and believe that he lost his son in order for his eyes to be opened. Again, that water imagery, cleansing and washing everything away. And quite beautifully, throughout the play, that sea imagery is, we're reminded of the sea and the presence of the sea and the cleansing effects of the sea. And Shakespeare does that here, notably, through the introduction of uh, Polypteton and, well, anaphora for sure, but repetitions of the word loss, 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 and then, of course, with the word lost as well. And that introduces um, a motif that is continued on page 137 that we'll look at later.
Okay, but this this very important idea of things being that we need to lose something in order to find something. In order for there to be wholeness, we need to to, uh, to, to grieve and we need to suffer a bit in order to see clearly. Top of 135. A daughter, oh heavens, that they were living in Naples, the king and queen there. So a bit of situational irony because we know that's what will happen. This is what uh, Prospero's plan is, that in fact um, they will be together um, in Naples as king and queen. An even better situation than just being the Duchess of Milan, okay, or the daughter of the Duke. So in this passage, Shakespeare contrasts clear perception and reason and the awareness of reality versus the confusion of illusion. 135, we'll go through that opening passage of Prospero's pretty quickly. He says, in this last tempest, I perceive... When did you lose your daughter? In this last tempest. Okay, so similar situation. The tempest has made them both lose a child. And, um, and he speaks of perceiving lords, devouring their reason, um, joss being jostled from their senses... And he says, now you know that I am Prospero. I just think the, the imagery is interesting of perception, reason. They question if their eyes have done offices of truth. They question truth and their senses and their perceptions. And it's very clear now at the middle, middle of his speech, 160, that he is that very duke which was thrust forth from of, of Milan. Okay, to make it very clear to us, make it clear to the man on stage. Yet then he, he says, not, he's not going to speak of it, yet more, no more of this. Um, he wants to have them look in on uh, where he's been living, his cell, his, his court, he calls it, okay, his, his dwelling on this island. He says, pray you look in, my dukedom, since you have given me again, I will requite you with as good a thing. So there's this, this idea of losing things and being rewarded. If you remember, Ferdinand comes on the island, he is given Miranda really there she is in front of him he thinks wow I'll marry you and then all of a sudden she's taken away and then he's punished and by becoming a slave then he does it well and he earns Prospero's good he earns his um, way into into Prospero's heart because he sees that um, Ferdinand is really truly in love with his daughter and then therefore he gains the hand of Miranda so there is quite a pattern of the, you know this this motif of losing and finding and, um, and 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 that's what's going to happen here with the curtain being drawn if there's a curtain or some however whatever he pulls he 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 reveals another spectacle an, an illusion of the island perhaps to, to the men looking at it where they see Miranda and Ferdinand playing chess and it's just a bizarre image and if you can you could just kind of breeze through it very quickly, or you can stop and ask yourself why chess. Naples was so basically the the Renaissance in England. Naples was the center of chess. It's a very physical game, not sort of like rugby or something, but it's it's a physical. It's a it's not a it's not something illusory like on the island. You know, it's not a it's not a mask. It's not theater. It's nothing to do with any kind of the images or visions these these people have been seeing. It's a it's a very um, it's a tactile game. It's a physical game. It is. Um, it is also a game of human activity, human reason. It's a microcosm of the European world. I don't know where I got that, but that's not my word, so I don't know. Sorry, quoting it from somewhere. A microcosm of the European world, and he is. Um, he's showing a sort of final vision of the island. You know, he's. He says to. He says, "I will quite you with as good a thing. At least bring forth a wonder to content ye as much as." me my dukedom so he's rewarding alonzo with his having immediately um, asked for pardon he is uh, rewarding him with a vision of his own son uh, and if you think about why it's a microcosm of the european world as i just mentioned when when uh, alonzo um, asks for forgiveness and prospero then sort it's almost like checkmate you know he wins the king he now, his daughter, will become queen of Naples. He has won in this game of chess. The, the, the black and white, um, the, the sort of good and evil figures on, on the chessboard help symbolize this battle that's taken place between good and evil on this island. There's also the element of the metatheatrical imagery, the idea that Prospero has been 
manipulating all the characters very much like a playwright manipulates his characters and moves them in different positions and places. And one character that seems to have moved, or indeed is moved, Sebastian, um, when he sees the couple, says, a most high miracle. There's no reason to believe that isn't sincere, especially when his partner in crime remains silent. Antonio says nothing. So once again, Shakespeare uses juxtaposition in order to characterize uh, Sebastian. Furthermore, the character of Sebastian here is proof of this ambiguity between good and evil and and how um, it is not always very difficult it is not very easy to see uh, so you know to, to put people into such clear categories we saw this earlier obviously with the character of Caliban and his use of verse and his potential and yet trying to rape Miranda we human beings are much more complicated than just black or white and again the questions of what it means to be civilized we have two very uncivilized characters coming from quote-unquote civilization, Antonio and Sebastian. You have Trinculo referring to Caliban as a, as a monster, when he himself is one, for even thinking of trying to sell him. And yet you have Ferdinand and Miranda, who have passed the test. And she won't be allowing Ferdinand to cheat. Once again, the female entity, Miranda, this quote-unquote uncivilized yet civilized girl, maintaining balance and order, hoping to restore the order that Prospero is seeking. Prospero's grand game of chess, really, uh, results in a restoration of balance and order. Everything is coming together as it should. Okay, so 133, he's lost his daughter, okay, and we're on 135, and his final vision of the island, um, the illusory quality of the island, and bringing us into reality through the chess game. And the awareness of Prospero's having been ultimately behind it all from the very beginning. Miranda then, uh, 137, says one of the most famous lines in English literature, which is, Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. We're on the top of 137. Okay, top of 137. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Tis new to thee. Prospero laughs at this innocent wonder that she has with all these men that are flooding the stage all of a sudden. If you remember, she had never seen anyone but Caliban, her father, and and then um, Ferdinand came along, and she was amazed by him, and he said he's really not that, you know, not that much to look at. And she still falls in love with him because, you know, those are appearances, and she falls in love with a good man that we, we as Shakespeare characterizes him. Anyway... Because if you remember in Act 3, Scene 3, Line 44, I've written here, he had said they still may be worse than devils. Uh, Prospero had commented on the men being worse than devils. So he knows who these men have been and what are, they're capable of. And yet for her, all she sees is a brave new world that has such people in it and, and, and is only and is, uh, sees the goodly creatures that are there and is drawn in by the illusion of them. Just as she was, just to sort of bring this play full circle around to the beginning, just as she was by the appearance of Ferdinand in the beginning. If you remember, she says something like, no, she doesn't understand why her father gets so angry with him, and she says nothing good could dwell in such a temple. So it, it's, the, the play has this nice cyclical effect coming back to that idea of appearances being quite deceptive once again, um, and how drawn is she? It, drawn in she is by it all. We have had our own uh, sus um, sense of disbelief uh, in theatre, in that they, you know the audience has been sitting here for a couple hours now, going through this play with the act with the actors and with the with the characters on stage, and they're amazed. Alon Alonso then says, "What is this maid with whom thou wast at play? Your eldest acquaintance cannot be three hours." You know, they've only known each other for a few hours and here they are playing chess together and they're going to be married. And, you know, <laughs> this is definitely a romance. You know, it's very magical and um, it's definitely not a tragedy. Let's put it that way. OK, so uh, especially with a marriage at the end, as I've mentioned before, Ferdinand mentions, sir, she is mortal. OK, so we are reminded again the importance of the physical nature of these characters, that there's no, you know, no more illusion now. Yeah, the illusion is over, the play is almost over, the, all, all of that is over, okay? Um, and he makes it very clear, um, this is a daughter to this famous Duke of Milan, okay? So Alonso 
starts to state on line 197 or so that he must ask his child forgiveness. Okay, I am hers, but oh, how oddly will it sound that I must ask my child forgiveness. Okay, there's, um, in Prospero then immediately cuts him off and says, there, sir, stop. Let us not burden our remembrances with a heaviness that's gone. Alonzo, remember, was behind the plot to get rid of Prospero and the daughter. And now the daughter that he tried to get rid of is sitting there ready to marry his son. So, of course, he must ask forgiveness. But it's, there's, no, there's no point to dwell on the past, I think is what Prospero is saying here, and Shakespeare himself, by, you know, you can link this back to Ariel and his speech in the present and the future tense. It's time now to think of the future. It's time to move forward, move ahead, not to be encumbered by things of the past. So, um, Gonzalo then reminds us also thematically remember all the threads of this play are being brought together now okay so we have the importance of prospero in order to prosper needing to you know forget the past and move on but he also has to recognize the power of his the power beyond himself the gods uh, again he can't mention jesus on the stage or anything here in the christian world but he can it can mention the gods in sort of a greco kind of roman fashion so just after stating Prospero to Alonso, you know, let's not be burdened with the past, Gonzalo um, and Shakespeare, Shakespeare through Gonzalo makes it very clear that there's a power beyond Prospero. Look down, you gods, and on this couple drop a blessed crown, for it is you that have chalked forth the way that brought us hither. Reminding everyone, the audience, the, the characters on the stage, everyone, that there is a power beyond the power that Prospero had over everyone, the power that... Um, you know, the love can have or forgiveness or whatever, but there's a power beyond even all of that. You don't have to believe in it, everyone, but you have to understand the Renaissance mindset. Uh, and the order with which such um, mentality and belief brings to humanity, the sense that there is a power beyond us. And some, it's, some, it's a comforting thought, a frightening thought as well sometimes, but a comforting thought that there's order to this universe. Um, I say amen, Gonzalo, says Alonso. So he recognizes in, with his use of um, religious imagery as uh, vocabulary, as he did in the beginning of the play, this is a, a believing man. This is a, at his heart, he is a Christian man and, and, and recognizes a power beyond himself as well. Even though he, he, he erred, he sinned, but he has um, suffered for it. So Gonzalo then, um, uh, okay, what I think is fun about Gonzalo's passage here is it reminds us of, so just to make my point clear, just as you must in an oral, you try to state your point, then find the, the, the facts to prove it. So I hope I'm doing that. We'll see. Um, Gonzalo highlights the miraculous effect that one sea voyage has had on all of them. So... Um, uh, I'll just read through the whole, read through the speech and then go back, okay, and, and find it. So, was Milan thrust from Milan? So, it's it's fun that the Duke of Milan, who is then thrust from Milan, the, the city, that has his issue should become kings of Naples, question mark. He realizes now that his daughter will become the queen of Naples. Oh, rejoice beyond a common joy and set it down with gold on lasting pillars. So, this is, this is something... Um, Marble, if you look on the left, marble column says the Trajan's column in Rome engraved with the stories of all the wars and victories. It's, it's, a, it's quite a story to be told that the Duke of Milan was thrust from Milan and now his, his daughter will become, uh, and her sons will become kings of Naples. Uh, this is then highlighted, this miraculous effect of the one journey is the one voyage, uh, the romantic effect of it all, the, the style of a romance here, the magical nature of it all. In one voyage did Clarabelle, her husband, find at Tunis. Right? So Clarabelle's married off in Tunis. Ferdinand, her brother, found a wife and where he was himself lost. Right? So we're reminded, again, this motif of things being lost and things being found throughout the entire play. Uh, found, uh, find, found, and lost. Um, yeah, so the magical nature of the one sea voyage is highlighted by Shakespeare through the use of a combination of zygma and polyptotum. The idea that find and found, of course, are the same root as polyptotum, you know, polyptotum, the idea that they're coming from to find. That verb, to find or found, through the use of zygma, is qualifying the one voyage and the miraculous nature of 
this one voyage that has done all of this and allowed so many to be found once again. It's important to, to understand the antithesis with what, that Shakespeare's playing with this, this concept that it's only when we lose things we find things. The importance of Prospero losing his power in order to find himself and a sense of his uh, his sense, his humanity, a sense of himself, his humanity, his old age to come, his recognition of how he will prosper as a human being in seeing his own daughter prosper. And again, Prospero, his dukedom in a poor isle and all of us ourselves when no man was his own. So they've all found themselves on this island and in this isolation, in this miraculously fantastical one journey, all these things have happened within a very short space of time. And it seems incredible. It seems like an illusion. It seems like a dream. And it's meant to seem like a dream. Okay, it's meant to be rather fantastical. Okay, uh, what did I write here? So note the transformations. Yeah, on the top of 139. So give me your hands. Let grief and sorrow still embrace his heart that doth not wish you joy. All right, so obviously the complete transformation on the, on the part of, of Alonso wishing Ferdinand Miranda joy and he's uh, acknowledging the, the wedding to come, the marriage to, uh, to come. Um, n note the many things that will be happening to these characters. Ariel becoming free, Caliban soon to learn a bit, become a little bit wiser, we hope. Okay. Um, and the changes that have occurred we still have, though, the character of, um, what's his name? Antonio, who has not spoken, right? We will have Seb uh, Sebastian speak again, and there's a sense here, especially when he's, he's the one who says, um, hang on, sorry. Sebastian, when he, when we, uh, sorry, to, to turn back to 135, just to add to Sebastian's characterization, a few lines in contrast to Antonio not speaking, he says, a most high miracle when they see Miranda and Ferdinand, having thought Ferdinand was dead. Antonio doesn't care. He hasn't said anything. But Sebastian does. He says, a most high miracle, right, on 135. So those little lines, especially for an actor up there, you know, wondering what line do I get to say next, he gets to actually kind of become a good guy again. Whereas and, um, Antonio hasn't spoken we don't ever get any proof of Antonio having really changed and really um, altered in his behavior or his, his, you know, his evil, really. Remember, he's, he's, he's killed, he's, tr he's tried to kill a brother. He has, um, he has committed um, one of the, you know, the, the archetypal sins, you know, this idea of fratricide, of Cain and Abel. This is, this is um, a very difficult thing to, to, um, receive forgiveness for and Prospero has done it there doesn't seem to be a, a sense though he's changed though Gonzalo says oh look sir here is more of us I prophesied if a gallows were on land this fellow could not drown so the bosun has arrived and if you remember he was the one Gonzalo who said that he his face was you know his he looked like he was set for the gallows not to be drowned and um, again, we have all this, the cyclical nature of this play and things, all the, all, you know, the denouement, all the, all the threads of the play being tied together here. Okay. And this idea of fate playing a hand and the recognition of fate and Gonzalo from the beginning of the play, having um, trusted in, in a fate or a higher power and guessing from the physiognomy of, of that man, uh, the, of the bosun that they wouldn't drown. Okay. And, and hoping for it. Uh, there's a lot you can say about Gonzalo. Yeah, there's nothing there's nothing naive or wrong about being hopeful as well, as, as long as that hope is being placed in something good, which it is for Gonzalo. If you remember, uh, now blasphemy that swears grace overboard, not an oath on shore. The antagonist had called the bosun, they had called, they had blasphemed, right? They had called him a blasphemous, uh, uncharitable dog. They had sworn at the bosun. And, and yet here he is. You know, all, all is well. The, the, the blasphemers are the ones. The blasphemers, the ones who have been swearing against God, and the the, the antagonists, uh, Antonio and and company, have been punished. Um, and yet, the bosun here is safe, and it makes it very clear that uh, with the three glasses, he says, "Our ship, which but three glasses since we gave out, split is tight and yar bravely rigged, as when we first put out to sea." 
so it's it's again very physically we have all the all the pieces of the tale being brought together here with the arrival of the sailors from the ship no harm done no one's been harmed again reminding us of that imagery of not a hair on their head you know from the very beginning this this idea of a of god caring about us to make sure that not even a hair on our head is has perished that's Prospero on the top of page 23. And um, it's important that Prospero and his plan that no one has been hurt. Okay, this is that's the whole point of this play, right? Forgiveness and moving on, not utter tragedy and decimating one's enemies. And the bosun carries on. I doubt you'd get this passage, to be honest, with all the lovely passages in this play. But just in case, um, he speaks of the, we were dead of sleep, okay? And the importance of this this of being of being uh, asleep and now everyone being awake you know everyone having their eyes opened and um, being grounded in reality and that happened with a roaring shrieking howling jingling chains you know if you were given this obviously look for you know always look for your your verbs here in the case the gerunds and the, the noises and the, the 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 loud sounds that awake them you know sometimes it needs to be quite drastic sometimes the the shock to wake someone needs to be to be drastic, and we saw that with the um, Alembic. Again, I think really everyone, the, the main thing is you have 10 minutes <laughs> to show your understanding of the play as a whole. That is really the most important thing. And then if you can throw in all these impressive things, great, do it, but make sure that it's, it's really serving a, a purpose. Bottom of uh, 139. So bravely my diligence, um, speaking again to his hard worker, his diligent one, okay, um, thou shalt be free. Um, Alonso then says, this is a strange maze as Hermed trod. A uh, tiny historical note. I looked up and found this is kind of fun. The first uh, real maze, you know, one of those hedge kind of mazes where you walk about, a labyrinth in a garden was in Hampton Court. So that's um, the earliest one. Totally doesn't make any difference to your oral at all. But anyway, it's just, it's just fun. The idea of mazes uh, being a new thing uh, for Alonso here. This is, and for Shakespeare. This is a... a as strange a maze as airmen trod, and there is in this business more than nature was ever conduct of. Some oracle must rectify our knowledge. Okay, so there's hinting again at the many threads again in this play, all the, you know, the idea of nature and nurture, the confusion, the illusion, mazes, and, and all of that. Okay, but Prospero once again on 141 asks him, we're on 141 now, top of 141, uh, Sir, my liege, do not infest your mind with beating on the strangeness of this business. So he doesn't. He wants to. He wants to move on. Okay. There's very much. Uh, it, I, I think it would really slow down the play, especially just in terms of having to go back and explain it. The whole story we've actually already, exper already experienced. Alonso and others don't know, but to, to to take the time to tell it, no, it would completely destroy the the, the pace and rhythm. Um, we need to move to conclusion, need to move to forgiveness, need to move on, is, is what's happening here. And he says, I'll resolve you, which to you shall seem probable of every, every these happened accidents. Okay, so, um, which to you, an explanation. So, um, a parenthetic clause here, just, you know, uh, it, but it, it speeds it up. Yeah, the explanation. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you all. Let's move on. Okay, <laughs> so to, to... To carry on with this page, we have, of course, the subplot, um, the subplot of Stefano and Trinculo and Caliban arriving. And again, we finally then have Antonio speak. And look, he hasn't changed at all. Sebastian jokes and says, what are these things, my lord, Antonio, will money buy them? And remember, if you look at the picture on the left, uh, or a few pages over, they had tried on those dresses and things. I'm not sure if they're not coming on the stage wearing all those strange dresses and costumes that Ariel had laid out before them. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, in their stolen apparel. Absolutely. Okay, so it, it's meant to be that they're wearing the stolen apparel and that they're dressed probably ridiculously. And they uh, already are rather ridiculous, the, the characters themselves. And then on top of it, um, here they come in the, in the stolen apparel because they were you know, caught by illusion to put it all on. Which, of course, then is a nice parallel to Prospero and his, the, the, the contrast, the juxtaposition with their silly costuming and his, his serious um, putting on the robes um, of Milan to look the part, you know. Uh, Antonio finally speaks, 141. Um, Will money buy them, Sebastian asks? Very like. One of them is a plain fish and no doubt marketable. 
their minds immediately go to how they can make some money off of these men, how they can bring these freaks back to Naples and or in for the Brits, for the for the English, it would have been you know they would have been thinking about the the, the freak shows in in England and. They haven't changed, let's put it this way. They haven't changed. They're just as asinine and sarcastic and focused on um, on money uh, as they were from the very beginning. Okay, focus on, on, on their avars. Um, mark but the badges of these men, my lords, then say if they be true. So they're wearing badges that indicate that they are serving men in, um, for, for, for Alonso. Um, it says, yeah, emblems often worn by the nobles, noblemen's servants to identify them. Then say, if they be true, this misshapen knave, his mother was a witch. And I've already mentioned this idea, okay, this idea of a syndetum, this idea that uh, uh, Prospero mentions the, mentions the witch. And we are reminded, why is this important? Sorry, the point. The point is, when Prospero mentions who Caliban is and his mother, we are reminded of where this story could have gone. He could have remained a powerful wizard and decimated his enemies. He chose not to. He could have carried on bedimming the noontime sun on 127 and all of that. But no, he is not. So um, da, da, da. so the focus then, interestingly enough, with this ascendant, so could control the moon, comma, make flows and ebbs, and deal in her command, comma, without her power. It's, it, it, it's interesting, rhythmically, it brings it to, it really focuses on without her power, okay? Without having those connected words at that, and two sort of choice locations, by omitting them, the without her power is focused on. Prospero could raise the dead. Sycorax could take the moon's power. This could have ended very badly, very tragically indeed. Okay, but there's definitely a, a choice that Shakespeare's making in obviously fitting in with the meter of the line and deal in her command without her power. It's got to fit in ten you know, syllables. But um, we're reminded of the fact he has given up his power. I hope it makes it clear the, the parallel between these two, where the story could have gone. Uh, the bottom of 141, I mentioned this line already, Prospero acknowledging this, quote, thing of darkness as his own. Okay, There's a great essay floating about, if you're interested, I can share it with you, if you read Frankenstein in Sagant, some classes do. This idea that w we play a part in the children we raise, you know, um, we say in English, right, the apple does not fall from, far from the tree. In French, you say, what, dogs don't give birth to kittens? Or is it cats don't give birth to puppies? I can't remember, but it's one of those. He acknowledges a part, someone I knew would help me, um, acknowledges his part in the raising and formation of Caliban. So it's not all, les chiens ne font pas des chats, oui, c'est ça. Okay, um... So it's, it's, he's really recognizing his play, his part in this whole nature and nurture idea. Um, the subplot, of, of course, again, mirroring the, the main plot, all right? We're reminded, I, I, this is a great detail. Um, I was wondering why the grand liquor, it, it, does it say, yeah, made them, no, yeah. It says gilded them in your notes. But when I looked this up, it said it in popular science of the day, the polite term for calling somebody drunk. We're on the top, someone, sorry, on the top of 143. The polite, okay, so Stefano comes in roaring drunk. Remember, he's the one who saved himself by um, holding onto a barrel of alcohol and, and floating to shore. He's drunk and, you know, they're wondering, Sebastian wants to know where he got the wine, you know, because they had joked about that too, saying that they're an escape want of being drunk because they didn't have any wine and no time, no way to pass the time on the bare island. And um, so here comes in, um, Stefano reeling drunk and the polite term for being drunk was gilded. The idea of um, that they believed wine was the great elixir of the alchemists. Okay, and it comes, and I'll, I'll type this up because I... A-U-R-U-M-P-O-T-A-B-I-L-E. Aurum potabile. Sorry, great regret in life. I never took Latin. All right, for those of you who are into this kind of stuff, so this is drinkable gold. Okay, so they believed wine, grand liquor, was a drinkable gold, and therefore, if someone was drunk, they referred to them as gilded. Gilded, if you remember, is when you, you know, when you walk in, like, Versailles or some amazing um, building where they, you know, put gold leaf everywhere. That's gilded, to make gold. So it's just a joke. But um, it's just reminding us of how that subplot is mirroring the main plot. Okay, their alchemy experiment has been a drunken one, whereas... 
Prospero's, you know, astrology alchemy experiment of the day, his popular science of the day has been, has been a very profitable one. It has it had has resulted in um, forgiveness and moving forward, all right, and changing these men uh, forever. Probably not. I can't remember his name, Antonio, but um, but there, but but that doesn't matter. The whole point is that we are to forgive, to move on. Okay. Um, middle of, and we see then the wrapping up of the story between Prospero and Caliban, uh, Prospero acknowledging that Caliban, yes, is as disproportionate in his manners, we're in the middle of the page, as in his shape. Go, Sirrah, to my cell, take with you your companions, as you look to have my pardon, trim it handsomely. So there's, he's still hasn't completely forgotten or forgiven Caliban here, but he, there's a sense, as you look to have my pardon, okay, he wants, uh, Caliban wants Prospero's pardon for it. He says, okay, so, you know, take take care, you know, <laughs> prepare, t take care of them, prepare richly for my guests and all this. Um, I that I will, okay, the future signaling um, an ending that we will not be, we will not bear witness to. And the use of the future tense, I'll be wise hereafter, all right? He's not going to be so silly um, as to be a thrice double ass and take a drunkard for a god and worship a dull fool. He's going to seek for grace. So once again, he will undergo a transformation, has undergone a transformation, and has changed. Um, bottom of 143. Um, sir, I invite your highness in your train to my poor cell. And, all right, so for this one night, and they're going to speak, and then they're going to be going in the morning. Uh, this is not time on the stage to be telling tales. There's an entire play to summarize, and he's going to do that without of here, with, you know, out of our hearing. Um... Uh, but again, it's all very much focused on the future. And if you were given these lines, I somehow doubt you'd get these passages. I would, be, you know, I would skip to the end if I were an examiner. But if, you know, wherever you are looking at a passage that is dealing in, in the front, in the present or future tense, or you've got something in the past tense, you can, you, you can comment on how the ending is full of a future that we will not see. Okay, and the hopefulness of that future. There's nothing wrong with being hopeful, as I said. There's nothing wrong in the character of. Um, Gonzalo to have been, you know, a seemingly naive and silly and all that, and his hope for utopia and and it's laughable and we can mock him, but at the same time there's there's a, there's a goodness in him and um, and a goodness in 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 um, in looking forward and f into the future and to prospering in the future. Okay, and the imagery of the morning, right, uh, three o four highlights this. The, and in the morn I'll bring you to your ship and so to Naples. All right. Thence retire me to Milan, my Milan, where every third thought shall be my grave. Boy, that sounds depressing. Every third thought he's going to be thinking about his death? Well, his eyes are opened fully to what needs to happen. He's of a certain age, his daughter is marrying, and as we get older, these thoughts do become more prevalent. We do um, f focus, obviously, more on... Um, uh, this, let's put it this way, with all this, the imagery of illusions throughout the entire play, this is about as physical as you can get, okay? Uh, the great equalizer, you know, we all, at some point, will be um, in a grave. Sorry, welcome to literature. It's nice and depressing, okay? It could have been worse, though. We could have added the tragic elements to it here. But I think it's more that his eyes are wide open. You know, he is not being deluded himself by his own image his own illusions remember how angry he got at the you know the mini epilogue after the mask how he himself got transformed himself by his own illusor you know his own illusions this is a, not a man who is uh, going to waste any more time with illusions with um, with appearances he is facing the rest of his life as head on face facing it clearly Grounded in reality. Um, retire me. Uh, the reflexive mode was used more commonly um, back in uh, Elizabethan period, okay, uh, to withdraw, like the French. And of course, with this idea of withdrawal, retirement, slowing down, uh, pausing, it mirrors the meta theatrical idea of Shakespeare saying goodbye to the theatre. If this was indeed his last fully solely written play. Um, 
and not writing others later, perhaps in tandem with someone else. If he really is saying goodbye to the theater, um, that matches that idea that's present throughout the play. But more importantly, it fits the idea of of a of a man sensing one's life is is coming to a close and um, needing to reflect on life's greatest equalizer, which is um, that we all at one point will uh, find ourselves in the grave. All right, we're on one forty five, everyone. Um, this is the, the you know final page of the play, and just before the epilogue, just to make it really clear what's happening with Ariel and Prospero. Remember, we had that very close relationship to enable Prospero to later learn from Ariel how to be human, and the importance that Prospero focuses on the that he's now focusing on the on the future, and it's very positive, and the the use of the verbs you know I'll deliver and I promise you. There's no time to dwell on the past. The focus now is on the freedom for Ariel to be set free to the elements. And of course, you have that closeness again with the possessive my Ariel and the use of the pronouns. It's not, however, clear what's happening to Caliban or Sebastian or Antonio, really, what really will be their fate. But the play is not treating on that. It's not focusing on that. It is about moving on and letting things go. And that's where we are left off with the epilogue. Okay, so... This was a common, if you look on the notes on the left, it's a common convention in the Renaissance period, the idea that a, you know, an actor would come up on, come out on the stage at the very end and, um, and would make a plea to the audience for applause, if you think of Midsummer Night's Dream, and Puck, if you remember, you know, If We Shadows Have Offended, if you remember that, it's a, it's a common, it's a common convention of the day. So we mustn't be too surprised about that, but what is surprising is the pronounced shift in rhythm. So for most of the play, except for the songs, for example, Shakespeare has used iambic pentameter, or of course, prose. Shakespeare, as you've noticed, is, as the questions have been asked about the, the, the verse that he uses, doesn't, there are moments where you really don't even notice it. He's, he's by the time 1611, by this time in his, in his writing career, he has mastered the art of iambic pentameter in terms of not being a slave to the sort of roses or red, violets or blue kind of boring repetition. And then all of a sudden now, we have, now my charms are all or thrown, and it's beats of four, and it's a very different rhythm, but it's also, it's also all rhymed. And it seems, it's, it's very different from the way that he's been writing before, which has led scholars to think that maybe Shakespeare didn't actually even write this epilogue, that it might have been someone else. I don't think that's really that important to focus on, but I think what you should focus on is the fact that the rhythm changes is so pronounced a shift, the epilogue is so different from the rest of the play, in that it's announcing with this repetitive rhythm, reminding us of the return to balance and order, it's also slowing down the play at the end here. It's also bringing us to a conclusion, bringing us to a close. The term for the meter is catalectic, trochaic, tetrameter, it's incomplete in that there are seven syllables. Now my charms are all or thrown. It becomes very repetitive. But because the trochees are the opposite of iams, and again I've mentioned this earlier, if an iam is the most natural way of speaking, the trochee is the opposite. Now my charms are all or thrown. It's not, the, it's not when it's unstressed, stressed. It's not an iam. It becomes rather magical again and otherworldly, like the songs were. But the difference here is, by having seven syllables and not finishing one of the trochees, it feels unfinished. And scholars have suggested that this fits then the sort of, yes, the magic of the final you know, epilogue of the play, and yet the faintness of Prospero towards the end here, and the recognition that he is not the one with the true power anymore. The true power lies elsewhere in the audience's coming together with hands like prayer for the imagery in order to remind us of the greatest pardon um, possible in the Christian world, that of Jesus on the cross, uh, dying, not, uh, offering forgiveness before it's even asked for, like Prospero does with his brother Antonio. So there is a greater magic, a greater power beyond uh, Prospero's, and the rhythm matches that. Uh, in this passage, what's important about it, and that's what you'll have to do in your oral, you always start with, 
what is important. And what is important about this passage is that it's connecting Shakespeare. Shakespeare's art and Prospero's art are being paralleled here. All right, Shakespeare and his possible retirement, again, scholars disagree. 1613, he was still partly writing uh, plays. This is, most agree this is, this is his final fully, solely written play. So there's an announcement of perhaps possible retirement, Shakespeare giving up his theatrical arts, and Prospero, of course, has given up his magical arts. So that's one important thing. The other important thing about this epilogue is that it's characterizing Prospero, and we'll go through and sort of prove all this, yeah, but just to announce in general where you're going first. So the, the character of Prospero is now full of humility. He is not the man, the, the magician, full of hubris, raising the dead and perhaps leading this play to a tragic conclusion. He is a man, first and foremost, uh, where he said every third thought will be his grave. He is, he is a human, he's a man, full of humility. And he there's a sense that he recognizes by his asking the audience, yes, in this convention, to put their hands together and pray, that he's asking for them to, to see if he's pleased them in, in this play. He's asking uh, also then to be forgiven through this prayer, if you will, this hands coming together to clap prayer, which then leads to the last point. It is a blending of Shakespeare and Prospero for sure, and it's a definite blend. There's this blend between Shakespeare and of Shakespeare and Prospero, and the blend of the very magical atmosphere we've had throughout the entire play, and the very real, quote, bare island or bare stage that the audience is seeing. This blend of meta-theatrical language and illus the illusory nature of theatre and the need to be free from those illusions. It is not healthy, as we see with a character like Blanche, for example, to be totally immersed in one's illusions. It, but it's, it's not considered healthy to be living um, totally lost in one's illusions. And there is this, this uh, constant blend in the epilogue, as we've seen throughout the entire play, of, the, of illusion and, and reality, side by side. Now, we're going to go through uh, the lines, except that I'm, I'm going to break it into three parts, which is what I would recommend you do for your orals, that you announce to the examiner the importance of the, the passage as a whole, and then take the time to go through and look at some of the details. And to do that, the best way is to break down the passage. So the very beginning, the very first lines, or first three lines, now to which is most faint, again, everyone in the class could do this differently. A hundred people doing this could do it differently. There's no wrong, okay? It's just you go with, you move what you are first see in the passage the shifts in tone or shifts in atmosphere, shifts in imagery. Whenever you see changes, try to follow those. Try to use the, the rhythm and the, the logic with which the writer um, created his, his work. Use, use what they did already. So he, he states, now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have is my own, which is most faint. So he has given up his magic. And there's no there's no passion here. There's no anger. There's no regret, I guess. There's no... It's just a fact now. And we're reminded of how he's been in control the entire play. He is now in very much in control of giving up this power. Now my charms are all o'erthrown. And what strength I have in my own. He has no magic. He only has his own faint strength. He's an aging man and he's recognizing his own mortality which is, as I've said, about as grounded in reality as you could possibly get. He carries on addressing the audience. Now it is true, I must be here confined by you. All right, so th I would say this is the next part then. I should have announced that. So this idea of being confined on the bare island, on the stage, and then the request to the audience to, to have his spell broken, this magical theatrical spell broken by the audience clapping their hands. So uh, to go back to line uh, three, now it is true, I must be here confined by you to the audience, or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom God and pardon, be, pardon the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell. There's a curious blend here of the actor. Yes, I can state the line. Yeah, I can go back. So again, though, this everyone can do this differently. I'd say lines what, one through three, then four through... Well, you could break this up even further. Three through uh, eight or so, then nine through 
mercy itself and frees all faults, line 18, and then 19 and 20. Again, it's got to make sense to you, all right? So I reserve the right to change my mind here. I'm doing this quickly. If you have a half an hour to plan this, you um, you try to break it down, all right? You try to you try your best to, to break it down as, as much as possible. But the three major points here would be this idea of him recognizing his, his faint uh, strength, his being an old man, his humility in his condition, uh, and having no magic. The second point would be his discussing and, and mentioning that he now is the one who's confined. Okay, we have a sort of a, uh, the tables have turned. The, he was confined in Caliban and Ariel, and now he's the one confined. And then at the end, he's going to be asking the audience to break him from his spell. All right? The lines blend a bit, so I, I think if you put it to three points, that might be the easiest. Again, I'm recording this, so you can listen again if you missed this, if it wasn't clear. And um, if it isn't clear, do ask, and I will go back and try to edit and make it a little bit clearer. Okay? Um... So what's interesting, and I, I love this, is this, this combination, again, throughout, you know, the blending of the magical and the real, the blending of the magical and the real, where he says, let me not since I have my dukedom got. Well, that's the act, that's the character. The character, uh, Prospero, has gotten his dukedom back, not the actor, not the man who's addressing the audience, not the man who's breaking the fourth wall, if you will, by speaking to the audience in an epilogue, which is purposefully aimed at the at the audience. It's not a it's not a soliloquy, it's not a character and in their interior thoughts. This is very clearly an epilogue spoken to the audience. So what's fun is the um the blend that he does here between the, the character who would like to be the character who the, the man who's speaking, the actor who's speaking to the audience, and yet then he's still partly in character by saying, I have my dukedom got and pardon the deceiver dwell on this bare island. Breaking this whole illusory idea that the bare island he, he then would, as an actor, would be pointing to the stage that he's standing on, making it very clear that this has been, this whole project has been a, a reminder of the importance of theatre being yet another illusion. Uh, this is a real world, a wooden stage, probably bare by this time of any decor that might have been brought in. And he then is going to be asking, he, he's, he's, he's confined by the audience's spell. And the, audi the magic now is shifting to the audience. It is the audience, it is the world of the theatre that has the magic, that is the magic. And he is asking, he says, but release me from my bands. So this, the bonds that he has that, that keeping him in this illusory world with the help of your good hands. So please start clapping. And then he says, and please start hooting and yelling. And you know, remember the Renaissance theatre of, of, in England, the... <laughs> Shakespeare's day was more like a, a football match, yeah? People weren't sitting there, you know, quietly contemplating the, the wonderful world, words of Shakespeare. I mean, they were in there, in the thick of it, yelling and screaming and, and throwing things. It must have been really fun. And so here he's saying, gentle breath of yours. So the things that the audience would say, shouting out or saying, woohoo, or whatever at the end. And he's asking for that, for the, the loud noise of the hands. If you remember, we had the noise, we've had noises throughout um, you can make a parallel here with Heart of Darkness, you know, that use of sound and silence. It's kind of interesting, but the, the, the loud noise to break spells throughout the play, the noise with which the, the men, they said they heard a, a noise when they, were, when they were about to kill Alonzo and, and, his, and, um, and Sebastian, was about to kill, Sebastian was about to kill his brother Alonzo. They, they, they speak of having heard noises, or, and then Gonzalo says, yes, he heard a noise too. It takes the noise or music or something to, to, to break the spell. It takes a, a magic in a way. And the magic here has got to be loud. Good hands, clap them together, and, and let's break free from this illusory state they've been in for a couple of hours, as we feel when we're watching a Netflix movie or something, and it would, it's difficult to rouse ourselves out of it. So um, the breath here would be the, the, the speech of the audience, somebody yelling things out. But um, in, in Shakespeare's day, they could have also considered breath like wind, and which then is spirit, which is uh, all sort of elements of life. Um, I'll see if I can make that clearer. It, but you just, you just need to understand that this idea of, of breath is, then, is, is related to life, and he needs the, the life power of the, the, the spoken speech and power of the audience the magic of the audience, to figuratively let him sail, uh, sail away from the island. Okay, So the imagery of 
freedom with the sails being full of wind and life and moving on. And gentle breath of yours my sails must fill or else my project fails. In this case now, the project is not an, alchem you know, an alchemist's project. It's a project of entertainment. And now we clearly are stepping out of the, the realm of imagination and theater and we're stepping into here I am, a poor actor on the stage who just wanted to please you. So, which was to please. The project is to please an audience, of course. So, with this pleasing of the audience, he's hoping to gain their release. That these actors can go home to dinner, go home to their wives and children, and carry on with their lives. Their real lives. There's also the element here to remind you of that first point I made about the, the old man and no magic. There's a... and, and the the characterization of Prospero, there is a, there's a real sense of humility here. There's no, there's no statement of, I have now pleased you and we're leaving. It is, did I? I hope I have. I really hope that this play has pleased you. Please release me. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a real penitent humility here. There's someone who's recognized the excesses with which he was living his life on the island and even before, and the very reason that he lost his dukedom in the first place was his over-dependence and interest in magic and the arts, and it's, you know, it swept him up, and he was blind to the fact his brother was, that he was allowing his brother to have too much power, and he lost, he lost, he, he didn't do his duty, you know, it kept him from doing what he was put on earth to do, which in his case it was to be a duke. He, uh, he needs forgiveness as well, so there's all of this coming together, the actor the character, the playwright um, himself wanting uh, to be to to have pleased the audience, the um, all of it coming, all of it blending together, and it's really not easy to pinpoint which line is, you know, to which uh, to Prospero or Shakespeare or the actor or the you know, the character himself, Prospero. I think you you do need to see it as a as a huge sort of maelstrom of a lovely blend of reality and illusion here. Uh, again, now he is a man who has been in control, is in control, and this is, he's not abandoning his magic um, uh, without having thought carefully about it. He is, he, has, he is making the right decision here. We see someone full of reason. Um, now I want my spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair. So he, when he says, I want, he, does, he needs, he's lacking. Okay, he doesn't have them. Now I want. He doesn't have them. He wishes he could have all of this. And his ending will be despair. The ending of this play, the ending of Prospero, the ending of Shakespeare, the ending of the act, whatever, all of it will be despair unless this whole point of this play, not the whole point of this play, but the whole point of play for an audience is if there is no clapping at the end, it means it was an utter failure. So his ending will be despair unless I be relieved by prayer. And here we have then, we come full circle round to true magic and the very Christian nature of this play and the very uh, humble idea that there is something beyond us all, uh, as he says, which pierces so, something very strong as well, very, you know, potentially um, very fierce, that assaults, if you look at the verbs there, pierces and assaults. It's true magic. It's true strength there. Prayer pierces and assaulting. It's strong. It pierces and assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. The sounds there are very free, very soft, and yet it's being juxtaposed to the power of prayer, true magic. Playing again with the idea that the audience is putting their hands together, clapping... Most of them are not thinking, oh yeah, we're here praying. No, they're not thinking that. But Shakespeare is playing with that imagery and reminding us with the final rhyming couplet, as you from crimes with pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. He's reminding us with that final couplet. It's a line that echoes the Lord's Prayer, which is for Christians, uh, Protestant or Catholic, they word it slightly differently, but it's forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Everyone in that audience would have known, would have known for sure that prayer. It is very clear that he's making um, a very clear point here that while we forgive our sins, forgive those who sin against us, 
there is a, a freedom to be gained in forgiving that when you we human beings do not forgive we ourselves are confined just like similarly to what the, the actor and also Prospero is saying in the middle of this epilogue saying that he himself is confined on the stage unless he is set free so he the Shakespeare or Prospero or the actor or all are seeking some kind of forgiveness some kind of freeing forgiveness by by having hands come together in that image of prayer and applause all all at once the audience would have also been aware and remembered uh, not long before uh, Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe, which was a great hit in London. And at the end of that play, the, the very last minute, um, Dr. Faust, the, the scholars go off and pray for him. It's too late. He's already sold his soul to the devil and all that. But it's the audience would have been fully aware of the importance of uh, prayer, not just, you know, they would have learned it in, in church for sure, but they would have known it from the stage and the importance of uh, how this necromancer, because that's what he was, if he raised the dead, how he has transgressed so far that he's going to need a higher power to free him. And that's why prayer is so important here. Um, there are entire books written, probably just on the epilogue. So um, I, I think if you remember always to stay with you know, the, the transformation of this character, the idea of, of some of the, the, the imagery that's been repeated throughout the entire play here, we, again, we have the idea of the sails and the, the sea imagery, you know, and, the, and that in this case is not destructive, but freeing. All of it, all of it blends together to give this curious mix of um, illusion and reality blended. Uh, yeah. Miss. yeah. Uh, I don't understand because until then it was uh, the highest power was uh, forgiveness, right? Yeah. And and now is the audience uh, satisfaction? Uh, I think that they're together though. The idea of forgiveness and prayer, because of that imagery of hands going together and prayer, it's it's tied yeah. to, it's tied in that image of the hands coming together in prayer, but then it's also applause. So the two are tied together. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's it's you know it's like it like all poetry though. All poetry, the minute you start picking it apart, it sort of starts losing some of its power. What he does so well is the imagery that you should see in your mind of the idea that the audience has the power to free this man with their applause, but by doing so, by putting their hands together, it is reminding them and us and all of us of the importance of a greater, because the praying would be to God, right? So the idea is that, and, and, and God is in the, the ultimate position, Jesus in this case, in a Christian context, to forgive sins, you know, without having asked to, um, whether uh, forgiving sins without anyone asking him to. And that, that's the important thing here, is that the, the hands are coming together, and, and um, yes, in the context of the theater, and a rowdy theater and everything, but to recognize a higher power above, yes, forgiveness, but it's connected to prayer and that ultimate forgiveness. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. The trick is then to try to say it yourself and try to, you know, to explain it yourselves. Any other questions? We can talk um, links to the rest of the program. We can talk if you've got questions about the entire play. I'll, I'll, how about if... How about if I uh, stop recording for a minute, stop talking for a minute, let you think for a few minutes and come up with any questions you might want to ask and I will go and fill up my coffee.